10,000 UFO reports. There have even been some sightings reported right here in the nation's capital. UFOs have interfered with missiles at U.S. Air Force bases. We are at war. Out of the people trying to get away. Against a foe that is bent on our destruction. Leading scientists said it would happen. Contact. Extraterrestrial intelligence. This is not science fiction. It's science. And experts from Stephen Hawking to NASA to the Pentagon say they may not come in peace. If aliens actually did show up tomorrow and decided they wanted something here, we'd be in big trouble. If they're coming in and landing, it means they feel that they have overwhelming technology and overwhelming force. We're opposed. Top astrophysicists and military defense consultants can now reveal there are actual high-level plans to fight an alien invasion. From the Pentagon to the UN, alien invasion is taken seriously. The United States has a multitude of plans. We have wargamed out every scenario imaginable. Having worked for 21 years at the Ministry of Defense, I know full well that there are, of course, deeply classified projects. We have ways of fighting back against the aliens that are not yet public knowledge. What are the official plans for contact with extraterrestrials? Will they come in peace or war? And what can humanity do in the face of alien invasion? Sometime in the future, possibly the very near future, the world will go about its business as usual. But at a remote observatory, a space anomaly is reported. Can you come here for a second? Something unusual and large appears to be approaching Earth. Experts aren't sure how to react. The first thing you would do is assume that it's another asteroid, because we find them all the time. Every night we find them. Nobody gets terribly excited about that. What would change your mind is if you found that it wasn't in, a, in the usual elliptical orbit around the sun like everything else. All right, Project get, 3, Professor, we have this. The first sighting alerts sky watchers around the world. We are monitoring space with all manner of telescopes, some of them optical, some of them looking at the infrared spectrum. We have a whole range of surveillance equipment. So there are a lot of eyes on space. The object is only 5,000 miles from Earth, closer than our moon. It has crept into Earth's orbit with no warning. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot brighter than 17.8. Now, astronomers scramble to analyze any data they can get. The object is being tracked, and it's clearly not an asteroid. But what is it? The next group to take an interest in the anomaly is not scientific, but military. The U.S. Space Command at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado. 
Its idea is to detect and defend against air or space threats against North America. And so it has uh, systems in place all around the world, global satellite tracking systems, telescopes, radar, and others that search for any type of airborne or space threat to this continent. The space command experts don't like what they see. Military satellites and high-end telescopes are refocused on the object. The initial analysis suggests the object is not natural, and Space Command makes a call. The President of the United States would be informed very quickly and would rapidly seek advice from the Secretary of State for Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. The President's number one question and concern would be this. Is there a threat? Could the object be some sort of alien craft? Experts say this science fiction scenario is possible, and it's being explored by astronomers, governments, and military strategists alike. Renowned astrophysicist Stephen Hawking has stated that extraterrestrial visitors might be hostile. Advanced aliens would perhaps become nomads, looking to conquer and colonize whatever planets they can reach. He is not alone in his concern. Nick Pope is a former executive officer with the British Ministry of Defense. I'm convinced that there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. And if that's the case, aliens might regard Earth as a potential threat. Some say alien invasion is considered a real threat by everyone from the US to the UN to the UK. Plans are in place. Paul Springer is a strategy expert at the Air Force Air Command and Staff College. In the case of a global invader, depending on the situation, the United States has a multitude of plans. We have war-gamed out every scenario imaginable. With my 21 years at the Ministry of Defense, I've clearly gained an insight into how we would fight an alien invasion. Unfortunately, most of that is classified information. We don't share our operational secrets with the rest of the world. But there is one government scientist who has developed his own plans for an alien invasion. And he's not afraid to talk. His name? Dr. Travis Taylor. A physicist and Defense Department engineer, Dr. Taylor helped develop next-generation armor systems for troops in Iraq. He is a senior Army research scientist and has worked on the U.S. military's new laser, the most powerful solid-state laser weapon in the world. He has top secret and above clearance at the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command. Dr. Taylor has developed a detailed strategic plan for surviving an alien invasion. I was working on a project for the intelligence community on how to fight an asymmetric war. And we got to think about, is it likely that we ever would be invaded by aliens? And we decided that it's very likely and that we needed a plan. His co-author is Bob Bowen, defense intelligence consultant and aerospace analyst. If there is an attack, just like Hurricane Katrina, there's going to be chaos, and it's going to take time to respond. But at U.S. Space Command, Astronomers don't even know if the anomaly is an actual vehicle. Uh, then, confirmation. In a solar system where every object is constantly in motion, the unknown object 
it stops. The object looms quietly. No light, no movement. But Space Command officials agree that the object must be powered. And if it is, it must be from an intelligent source. There's going to be some, some pretty frayed nerves because you don't find too many military professionals that are thrilled to see a higher level of technology than what they have to play with. Our first hope would be clearly that these were peaceful explorers and our aim would be to establish communication. But there is a problem. Who would do the talking? I think because they've seen it in the movies a lot, people assume that there's some sort of protocol or some official body that's worrying about, you know, how we're going to get in touch with the aliens if they show up, that kind of thing. Well, there isn't. The closest thing we have to an alien ambassador is the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs. Former U.S. diplomat and space policy advisor Michael Michaud helped create a proposed UN plan for alien contact. The International Academy of Astronautics developed a draft protocol for communicating with a species that might be detected. And these documents were presented to the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space in the year 2000. The protocol says, no response to a signal or other evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence should be sent until appropriate international consultations have taken place. Now, as the leaders of the world ponder their reaction, word leaks out to the population at large. Lots of people are convinced that aliens are making contact. Chinese authorities are investigating reports of UFOs. We begin with shocking allegations that the United States government is keeping the information secret and monitoring UFOs and aliens. The member states of the United Nations Security Council are convening today in New York to discuss a possible emergency session of the General Assembly. I didn't say it was a, a spaceship from another civilization. I said it was something in the air that we couldn't identify. Is anyone out there? How would we react if they did land? Are we alone? A UN committee quickly crafts a simple message. Transmitted to the spacecraft over television and radio signals. To be spoken by leaders of our planet's most prominent nations. There will be many issues to discuss and we are willing to move forward without preconditions on the basis of mutual respect. The message is transmitted simultaneously in the most widely spoken languages of the world. Mandarin Chinese, Spanish, English, Arabic, and Hindi. But the carefully crafted message may get competition. Everybody with the capability of, of building a transmitter and fixing it to a backyard satellite dish would aim that satellite dish at this thing and start telling them their personal stories. Think, okay, wait a minute, this is a little bit... I'm sure that would happen. We must commit ourselves to an effort to find common ground, to learn from each other, to respect right. one another. It's easier to see... As the message is transmitted... <laughs> The entire planet now watches the skies. The question is whether we spend that time... 5,000 miles above the Earth, the alien object rests in orbit. Astronomers see no response to Earth's communication. At Space Command, officials remain on high alert. They don't detect any changes from the visitor. 
It's possible the alien vessel doesn't understand our message. Space Command attempts simple contact through the universal language of mathematics in a sequence of prime numbers. There is still no response. In fact, science suggests that silence may be predictable. We don't have anything like full-fledged communication with any other species on this planet. So that raises the question, how feasible will it be if we're talking to or trying to talk to a species from a completely different evolution with a completely different idea of what language is. It has been attempted many times with chimpanzees. It has been attempted many times with dolphins. And the results have been very, very limited. We talk with our mouths and we hear with our ears, but there's no reason whatsoever that aliens have even got to have mouths or ears or, or you know, even use uh, audible speech as a method of communication. Then, just as many had given up hope, the object begins to move. This is it. The moment predicted by scientists and visionaries. First contact. Satellite lenses lock on. Telescopes tighten focus. Electronic imagery sensors await a response. Within seconds of the craft's first movement, Visual contact is lost. It seems we've lost. Uh, Screens go blank. We'll try rebooting them. Mm -hmm. Data streams cut out. We think now it may have something. Why? Why? Oh, this is something with an intelligence behind it. Around the entire globe, communications suddenly cease. Cell phone calls are dropped. I don't know what happened. TV images go out. ATMs won't work. No one is sure of the extent of the problem at first. But at Space Command, they realize what others only guess. All of Earth's satellites have failed. But was it an act of war? or an attempt to reply. Maybe they were trying to connect with our satellites and communicate with them, figure out a way to communicate with us. Or maybe we were doing something that was detrimental to them, they were just defending themselves. Communication is difficult enough on Earth between different cultures, let alone with an alien civilization. In the early days in the war in Iraq, there were a lot of very unfortunate civilian casualties at checkpoints because to Americans, this means stop. To Iraqis, it means hello, come on up. And so our soldiers would put their hands up, stop, cars would come forward and they'd open fire. As diplomats and generals heat up phone lines, the Pentagon raises its state of military readiness to DEFCON 3. DEFCON refers to the defensive readiness condition of the U.S. military. DEFCON 5 is normal. DEFCON 1 is war. The last time the U.S. went to DEFCON 3 was September 11th. 2001. Now, satellite communication has failed, but optical and radio telescopes are still receiving information. Okay, keep recording. Okay, come on. Keep recording. And what we discover is stunning.
17, get a better look at it. It'll be still up. On the streets of our major cities, citizens look up. As a new player makes a grand entrance onto the world stage. Earth now faces an event unlike any in human history. There's going to be a certain degree of panic, and that may be true even within the military. There's going to be some, some pretty frayed nerves. Uh, are we being attacked? No. America's military alert is raised and the Russians? to DEFCON 2. The last time the United States experienced DEFCON 2 was October 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis when America feared an imminent nuclear attack. The underlying question is, what are the aliens here for? Are they a threat? Or will an alien intelligence bring new technology and goodwill? A lot of people have this notion that if aliens have evolved to a point where they could travel between the stars, then they've evolved beyond things like malicious intent, like warfare and whatever else. Well, that's unlikely. Biology actually suggests a more frightening possibility. Intelligence is often the mark of a predator. Predators tend to be smart because they have to outsmart their prey. There's a reason why a lion, for example, is more intelligent than an antelope, or a dolphin than a fish. Because it has to basically rework experiences and learn from it. It has to anticipate the future. I sometimes remind people that in the 1930s, the most scientifically and technologically advanced country in the world was Germany. And we know what happened over the next two decades. So there is no necessary connection between science and technology being advanced and moral or ethical behavior. As citizens of the world stare in wonder, America's military prepares for the worst. Squadrons of F-18 scramble into action. At this point, the plans for an alien attack are no different than the protocol for any confrontation. If we identify a enemy aircraft that is coming into the United States airspace and is not responding to uh, the civilian authorities, then we would scramble jets up to take a look at it. F-18s fly at one and a half times the speed of sound. They carry Gatling guns, air-to-air -air missiles, and over 10,000 pounds of munitions. The F-18s are possibly our planet's most effective and versatile air-to-air -air weapon. discovers firsthand the aliens are not friendly. Under fire, our F-18s respond with missiles 
fired at more than twice the speed of sound, they miss. If they were able to travel through the stars, then they have propulsion technology that is beyond physics that we even understand. So even if you could get a lock on with the missile, you shoot the missile, this thing would just jump out of the way and the missile would go by. You could never lock back on. Now the alien's hostile intent is about to become even more clear. It's the alien version of shock and awe. Shock and awe is the concept that by using sufficient firepower, you can change the will of a populace. The situation is extremely great. If you decided that the best approach was going to be shock and awe, you're going to want to show that you have global reach and show that you're capable of inflicting devastating power upon many different societies at once. And I think the most populous cities would be the logical choice if you're trying to get that massive terrorizing effect. The aliens have opened fire. Around the world, in every major city and capital, Earth experiences shock, awe, and horror. The invaders sending units of drones and robots. Just as the American military today uses drones as an advance force, robots create terror as they destroy urban centers. The invader would most likely go after things that would ideally create confusion among the masses. Those things that uh, would cause uh, chaos among the population. The invaders aren't hitting cities just for psychological effect. There is a more strategic purpose. They're gonna take out anything that looks like a piece of our war machine. And population centers, that's where the factories are. In World War II, we attacked Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which were industrial centers. They weren't necessarily army bases but they were the manufacturing infrastructure where you would build the war machine. The Pentagon quickly deploys one of the military's newest units, U.S. Cyber Command, headquartered at Maryland's Fort Meade. Cyber warfare units became widespread on Earth at the turn of the 21st century, as rival nations looked to conduct secret warfare and exploit weaknesses in each other's technology. In 2009, when the mysterious Stuxnet virus crippled computers and electronics within Iran's nuclear program, some wondered if U.S. military cyber units had directed the attack. Now, Electronic warfare battalions move into action. Military programmers attempt to intercept and decode alien communication. Humvees with broadcast dishes target the alien craft with microwaves to jam signals. The invaders from space are attacked through cyberspace. On the ground, a desperate military now unleashes experimental weapons. Having worked for 21 years at the Ministry of Defense, I know full well that there are, of course, uh, deeply classified projects, black projects, classified weapons programs that are not yet public knowledge. So it's 
likely that we would have ways of hitting back at the aliens that the public don't yet know about. One example, America's own space fighter, the Air Force's highly classified X-37B. Launched in 2010, this military mini space shuttle could possibly be weaponized and sent against the invader. But America's small space force must fight an armada. Workable experimental weapons exist in labs and bases across the country. Military lasers, beam weapons, literal ray guns. Dr. Travis Taylor has investigated one of the most fearsome weapons of all, a rail gun. It's been called the most powerful gun in the world. Super magnets accelerate a projectile along twin rails to unimaginable speeds. I mean, you can go thousands and thousands and thousands of miles per hour with a projectile, whereas a missile, you're limited to hypersonic velocities of, say, two or 3,000 miles per hour. So you could go maybe 10 times faster easy with modern technology. The generals order the unproven weapon bolted onto a truck bed and thrust into combat. But the experimental weapons are no match for a technology that crossed the cosmos. And even if there is a breakthrough, there is no time to mass-produce new weapons. If our planet stands a chance, the nations of Earth must merge their competing militaries into one global army of humanity. In the face of an alien invasion, can the nations of Earth unite? President Reagan once gave a speech where he said to the United Nations, I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Our former enemies now become our allies. If the aliens decide to invade, we could find ourselves standing shoulder to shoulder with the Taliban to fight the green guys. In Earth's darkest hour, the nations of the world combine forces. The warrior elite of our entire species acts as one. But Earth's armies are no match for technology that can travel between the stars. The defense organizations of the world, they're going to realize that their multi-billion dollar assets are not working. Their technology is so far superior to ours that ours isn't going to last long. Now. The aliens focus their attacks. So if I'm going to send some kind of a mission down to the, the Earth's surface, anything that could become a threat to that mission becomes the next priority. The alien Air Force clears the skies, then blasts military targets around the country. Successfully locating military targets is simple. The enemy follows our own radar signals. Anytime you turn on a radar system, you're emitting a radar pulse. And that's something that can be tracked. And 
If you're dealing with a civilization that's capable of space travel, you may not want to call your attention and, and their weaponry down upon you by turning on your radar, even though that's one of the best detection systems that we have. The alien craft seek out military installations around the world. They're going to take out all of our major combat units of all the governments and armies of the world. Uh, that's going to happen very quickly. It may happen in, in a matter of minutes. It might take a few days, but it's going to be very quick. Then they move on to attack the infrastructure of our society. The backbone of human civilization itself becomes a simple, undefended target. They're going to try to take out things that we would use to resist them, right? That's why they would look at the brightest spots on the map and start taking them out. And take out our power grid, because we need power to do everything. And so it is, all over this battlefield Earth. Military units obliterated. Cities ruined. Infrastructure eliminated. Humanity defeated. Somewhere in the United States, inside an underground bunker, the leader of the free world now weighs his nation's options. Mr. President. The plan to fight an alien invasion includes one remaining possibility with devastating repercussions. Somebody has to tell the president, Mr. President, we think the nuclear option is the only thing to do here. Nuclear weapons, the most powerful armaments ever conceived on this planet. There are over 22,000 active nuclear warheads on Earth. The combined destruction could wipe out the entire human species twice over. This may be the only effective option against the invaders, but it comes at a terrifying cost. Who would kill millions of citizens in a gamble to destroy the enemy? In America, only the president has the authority to make that kind of decision. And I think he'd be very remorseful and regretful and he wouldn't undertake that decision lightly. But at the end of the day, I think he would decide that that was the right thing to do. The president opens a briefcase the nuclear football, the portable launch codes for America's arsenal. Hatch. The first target, our nation's capital. If one ship is destroyed, it may cause the others to retreat. It's a demonstration of our destructive power and our resolve. Once that decision's made, then it's what is the most effective way to use them. So my first approach would be to drop the bombs on top of the vehicle so that at least the, the spacecraft would sort of shield the planet below. You still have a problem with fallout, but you would minimize the blast. Land-based nuclear missiles are already destroyed. But there is another delivery system that may be unscathed. You don't know where the submarines are at any given time. And so the submarine has the advantage that, in theory at least, it can surface, fire ballistic missiles, quickly submerge again, and disappear before the enemy has any ability to really respond to the attack. Somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, a submarine rises from the depths. 150 feet below the surface, a hatch opens. A Trident II ballistic missile bursts through the surface and takes flight. It carries nearly 3.8 megatons of destructive power, 250 times the size of the Hiroshima blast. As it soars toward its target, the missile's tip detaches. 
and breaks apart into eight warheads. These warheads are self-guided and not dependent on satellites. The nuclear warheads dart toward the alien vessel hanging over Washington, D.C. The fate of the planet rides on man's ultimate destructive weapon. Every building within four miles of Ground Zero flattens. Within downtown D.C., 98% of the population will die. But will it work? Earth's mightiest weapon has had no impact. The reason is simple. Travel between the stars requires protection. If they have the technology to get from their star system to here, they have to have either some metallurgy or they might have shields, like in science fiction. If you are traveling really, really fast in a spaceship and a micrometeorite the size of a dust speck hits you, it imparts a lot of energy to your spacecraft. It's many times the largest nuclear weapon ever built by mankind. So if they had shields, then it could withstand a nuclear weapon. And all we're going to do is maybe scratch their paint, but we've destroyed a whole city in the process. Our nation's capital is destroyed. Earth's armies are devastated. But in the secret plans for alien invasion, the war isn't over. This is only the beginning. From shielded bunkers and secret locations, the surviving military leaders issue orders for a surprising new tactic. Instead of attack, they order their forces to do the opposite, run away. It's very possible that the order becomes, get out of the cities and disperse yourselves as much as possible. It's preferable to annihilation, extinction, extermination of the human race. Hide the best you can, defend yourselves the best you can. Do not present viable targets. The military should be ordered to disperse. Take your weapon, take your ruck, take three days worth of food and go. We don't care where you go, just go. It's time to run, to live to fight another day. Remaining communications hubs call for civilian evacuation everywhere. It will not go well. Imagine a natural disaster on a massive scale. The Haitian earthquake. The Pacific tsunami. And Hurricane Katrina combined. In every city in the world, the big difference is that help will not come, ever. In the panic to flee, desperate crowds become rioting mobs. Humanity turns on itself. It is no longer an alien invasion. It's an alien apocalypse. An alien invasion can be looked at as what is technically termed an apocalypse. There's disasters, there's cataclysms. Apocalypse is already all the way at the top. All governmental structures are shattered, all societal structures are shattered. You're gonna have urban populations that are gonna be suffering drastically because now they're being cut off from 
all these things that they're used to, and suddenly they have nothing. Survival is going to become a decentralized thing. They're going to be an individual here and a, a group of three or four people here, and we're going to have to uh, persevere against the invader for probably a long time. The ingenuity of the individual will become the thing that is most important once the attack is underway. But as civilization falls, there is still a plan in place. There are some who keep their heads. They are thoughtful, they are prepared, and they have one goal, survival. This will be humanity's last hope its only hope on a planet now controlled by alien invaders. The alien invasion is complete. The invaders control the skies and the ground. With infrastructure destroyed, human survivors are going to be desperate. And without a plan in place, they will be unprepared and panicked. I can guarantee that most people are not ready to face an emergency because we rely too much on our ATM cards to get money. We rely on getting to the grocery store to get food. Nothing would be left on the shelves of the grocery stores within three hours of an event. It's not just the water and food that goes, it's everything. In mad desperation to stock up on supplies, mobs loot, riot, and destroy. If alien fighters don't kill you, other humans might. It doesn't matter if you're in New York City, in L.A., or if you're in Iowa. Human nature is human nature. People are going to fight over resources. Now staying alive means staying away from stores and the mob. Terrified masses swarm out of the cities in search of safety. You look at the nighttime global map, you can see where the aliens are going to attack. All the big cities where there are bright lights. So where you want to hide is the dark spots, in the Amazon, in the outback. Those are the places to hide. Roadways grind to a halt. Getting out safely by car may be impossible. This is going to be bumper to bumper traffic. People are going to start freaking out. They're going to abandon their cars right there in the road because they're really not going to care about the people behind them. It's happened before. In 2005, as Hurricane Rita approached Texas, millions fled. The highways around Houston instantly jammed. Vehicles ran out of fuel. The entire city highway system turned into a parking lot, and it lasted two full days. They said, hurricane's coming, everybody get out. And then what happens? Everybody runs out of their houses, gets in their car, and gets on the interstate, and then they stop because the interstate infrastructure isn't designed for that big of an evacuation. Now, even as the alien invaders bear down on humanity, society hasn't learned from past mistakes. But there are other options for men and women intent on survival. In general, you're gonna to wanna to avoid the main routes of travel. You're gonna to want to avoid the highways and the roads and the bridges. Cars may be death traps. A successful getaway demands some other form of transportation. A bike, a horse, a motorcycle. If you have a motorcycle, you can weave in and out of the traffic. Maybe you live in a city like New York, so having a, a dinghy and you throw it in the water and you can get upstate or get out of the city while, while everybody's complete gridlocked. For some, safety from alien forces and rampaging humans means going underground, literally. Subway tunnels, cable conduits, and even sewers all provide safe exits from burning cities. 
A sewer system's great because so few people will want to go through it. I mean, it's going to be nasty. It's going to be ugly. But it's going to be safe, relatively. It's going to be the road less traveled, and that's what you're looking for. Underground or overland. By boat. By car. By foot. Urban dwellers around the planet join a mass exodus out of the cities. Some may never escape. The invaders have now destroyed civilization as we know it. But according to the experts, the destruction of civilization is predictable, and it's accounted for in the plans to fight an alien invasion. In the face of invasion with highly advanced technology, military defeat may be predictable, but it's not the end of the war. Unlikely victories have happened before. The key there is for humanity to last as long as they possibly can and do things like the Mujahideen did in the uh, Soviet-Afghan war. Where they use terrorist-type maneuvers and rebellion to defend against a larger, more technologically superior force. Among the survivors left on Earth, in caves and forests and deserts all over the planet, there grows the seeds of rebellion. Alien invasion has come. But now it's time for Earth to fight back. As alien craft control our planet, a new question arises in the minds of survivors. Why? Why an invasion? And why Earth? Humanity's survival may depend on answering this question. I don't think they would come on some random plundering mission. I don't think they would attack us for fun. By now, it's clear that the aliens haven't destroyed our planet. Just our civilization. In the plan for an alien invasion, Dr. Travis Taylor has laid out the most likely motives for hostile invaders. Conquest, harvesting, or hunting. At best, they're simply looking for supplies. Maybe there's something here on our planet they want. One possibility is the most important resource on the planet. Water. But is water that rare? Discoveries about planets and moons, both in our solar system and deeper in the galaxy, reveal a different story. Water, heck, water is one of the most common compounds in the universe. So they don't need to come here for the water. The invaders may need Earth's minerals for their technology. But that theory, too, has problems. If they need minerals, the minerals exist elsewhere. They're not just here on the Earth. Other planets might actually be more attractive. The solar system is full of resources. In fact, a single asteroid can contain more gold, silver, aluminum, and zinc than has been excavated in all of human history. But the alien's motive may become clear as a strange new vehicle begins to patrol the skies. Alien vessels strip the land, collecting everything in their path. The aliens are harvesting two compounds on Earth. 
that our astronomers have found nowhere else in the known universe. Chlorophyll and protein, plants and animals. The aliens are harvesting life itself. So only really, truly unique thing, as far as we can tell at this point, is the presence of complex life on Earth. For the alien invaders, life on Earth may be just another natural resource to be exploited. Something may have attracted nomadic aliens to our distant planet. A chemical scent wafting through the cosmos. One signal that the Earth has been broadcasting, if you will, into space for about two billion years is the fact that we have photosynthesis, that there's chlorophyll, that there are plants, because they produced all this oxygen in our atmosphere, and their telescopes could find the oxygen. The scent of life may have attracted the invaders. And like most migrating species, they left their home planet for a reason. You leave to find resources. It can be food, it can be a space to make a nest. Often it's just space in general. That's why a lot of animals are territorial. It certainly doesn't make sense if an alien arrived to Earth without resources of interest to it for it to fight us. Uh, that would be spite, and that makes no sense at all. The best example is probably locusts, because they move basically from one region to another region and complete all the resources, utilize all the resources that are there, and then they move on. Even for species on our home planet, long distance migrations are often driven by the need to find new sources of food. If an alien species had depleted the resources on their faraway planet, Earth would be an appetizing target. If they did come and attack, Food is quite a likely thing they would come for, because obviously they've got to come somewhere where there's life, you know, somewhere like Earth, where there's a blossoming ecosystem. How can humanity survive in the face of invaders with superior technology who may be hunting us? With cities destroyed, remnants of humanity are on the run. Survivors must learn how to live with nothing. Life after an alien attack or any sort of global disaster is literally unimaginable. Simply access to clean water and food will be difficult. You have to be prepared for that mentally as much as anything. It's about having the will to survive. If you fail, well, there will be no one to write your epitaph. Urban chaos and failed evacuations kill thousands in the first day. More die as food and water run out over the next days and weeks. Lack of preparation becomes a death sentence. I would say 70% of the people probably won't survive, simply because they have taken no thought uh, to, towards any kind of preparation or any kind of knowledge of what it takes. A group of humans will first need three things. Water, food, and shelter. Some shelters take simple forms, like makeshift coverings beneath trees. But for others, the new home of choice is a cave. Caves provide shelter, natural camouflage, and easily defended entrances. Civilized people now need to relearn the skills of hunting trapping and foraging. People need to be mindful that there's gonna require some adaptation to get used to eating deer meat or squirrels. All right, you're right. The easiest task becomes a complete challenge. 
and that's your day, and by the time the sun goes down, you're wiped out and exhausted. And on top of basic survival needs, humanity's remnants now have alien enemies trying to hunt them down and destroy them. But some will make it. A person's survival depends on preparation, learning new skills, and developing the right mental attitude for a new world. Resourcefulness is paramount. Ordinary tools become lifesavers. Scavenged supplies, canned food, and clean water will be vital for the first days. Flashlights, batteries, and knives are as good as currency. The real key to long-term survival is other people. You would have to find groups that you could trust. As an individual, you would never survive. You would have to gather in groups and work together to survive. If you break a leg, you break an arm, that, that could be the end of it for you, especially if you're kind of just getting by. The lucky ones have escaped the cities. They've survived the first weeks in the wild. Survivors band together. They take shelter under canopies of forests. They come together in the safety of caves. Surviving groups still carry the last remnants of human technology. Yes, yes, we're here. Channel three. Come in. The alien invaders have destroyed the planet's best communications infrastructure and unwittingly left older, lower tech methods intact. Hell yeah. Far flung bands of survivors begin to connect with simple communications devices walkie talkies recovered ham radios, even old telegraph lines. Just because we don't use the telegraph anymore doesn't mean the lines aren't still intact. There are fiber optic cables, there are telephone lines, there are many redundant forms of communication. And once communication is set up, the survivors discover the core of a resistance movement. broadcast system. President, President. This is not a test. A special announcement from the President of the United States. Fellow Americans, we face... Hungry, tattered bands take courage from the surviving remnants of a devastated nation. We are at war against a foe that is bent on our destruction. <laughs> when the Union was turned back at Bull Run, and the Allies first landed at Omaha Beach, Victory was very much in doubt. Again, we are tested. There will be difficult days ahead, but I am absolutely confident we will succeed. Survival is only a first step. Alien harvesters strip the land of life. But for Earth's survivors, the terrifying harvest becomes an opportunity to fight back. One of the biggest problems with fighting the aliens would be getting inside their technology. We throw a bomb at it, they won't even scratch the paint. They've got these shields, if you figure out a way to get inside their shield, then you're likely to have a lot more effective damage. But there's a simple way in, using the aliens' own technology. The aliens' treasure becomes a trap.
Resistance has scored a victory. It's a small one, but it brings hope. We got one, boys. These low-tech tactics are an important strategic part of the plan to fight an alien invasion. And we attack them and we go and hide again. Guerrilla engagement warfare is what we would have to do. Earth can't compete against alien high-tech. So survivors must fight them with low-tech. The plan to resist the aliens is based on history. In wars from the American Revolution to the Iraq campaign, guerrilla tactics and small-scale explosives help level the playing field for a technologically inferior fighting force. Lots of little blows can do as much damage as, as one big blow does. In fact, generally speaking, Lots and lots of little blows does much more psychological damage. Military strategists have a name for this approach. Asymmetric warfare. And then it becomes a question of whose war gets fought. Does this become a war involving technology? Or does it become a long, drawn-out insurrectionary campaign? Right. If you try to fight him the same way in the same organization that he's used to fighting, he's probably going to defeat you. Come on. So you're going to find his vulnerabilities. You're going to hit his soft spots, hit his command and control nodes, hit his logistic nodes. You're going to attack when it's not expected. Today, one of the greatest experts in asymmetric warfare is also one of the largest defense departments in the world, the Pentagon. They've learned the hard way. Our military has had, at this point, a nine-year hardcore class on how to be insurgents. They've been fighting them for nine years. In Iraq and Afghanistan, America's overwhelming firepower is sometimes defeated with a simple roadside bomb. It's a low-tech mine type of weapon, but it causes concern amongst a technological force that just can't find them. And so the casualties are occurring. You don't know when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. So it has a wearing down effect on the uh, friendly forces. The insurgents also change their tactics regularly. Any new idea is only as good as the first time we use it. Think about improvised explosive devices. When they first started using those in uh, the Iraq uh, war, they used uh, doorbell buzzers and cell phone ringers. And then as we would figure out how they were doing it, they would switch to something else. They would use radio communications. Then they would switch to something else. The strategies are effective. In 2008, 70% of American deaths were from improvised explosive devices. One method the Pentagon uses to create counter-strategies to such deadly attacks is a game. A war game. America's military plans its tactics based on computer simulations and digital war games. These are often highly classified projects using some of the most powerful computers in the world. These computer scenarios help establish America's strategy and protocol around the world. When Travis Taylor's computer simulation is run for an alien invasion war game scenario, the war is short. The aliens win every time, sometimes within an hour. But when the time frame of the war game is extended from days to years, the results change. But in the long run, it's all about if you can kill them faster, then they can replace their troops. 
then you can chip away at that stone and whittle them down. And then you can overwhelm them. These war games form the basis of the plan for alien resistance. It's a simple rule of guerrilla warfare. Small attacks on a constant basis keep the war going. There's another benefit to taking out even one of the alien vessels. Fresh intelligence. Getting hands on the enemy wreckage could be a huge turning point in the war. Who are these aliens? What are they made of? What are they capable of? What makes these spaceships so great? But also, what are the weaknesses? Once you find those weaknesses, you can use whatever indigenous weapons you have to exploit those weaknesses. Six months of observation has also uncovered a critical characteristic of the invaders. Their numbers aren't increasing. The alien forces have ventured too far from home to rely on reinforcements. That means every lost unit won't be replaced. And that's a critical weakness. In the long run, the computer simulation now favors Earth. The winner of a war is the one who has the largest population at the end, and if the aliens take a year or 10 years or 20 years to get more aliens here to back them up, we might end up winning in a numbers game. Humans can take lessons on survival from the most populous creatures on Earth. Ants. Ant societies and those of other social insects are decentralized. There's no central leader or place where the rules get sent out. And uh, this is a real smart way of organizing societies. It's very hard to fight non-hierarchical systems like an ant colony. So you can kill all the ants you want in your kitchen, and it's probably not going to matter to the colony at all. Banding together helps keep the individual alive, and keeping the group small and separate helps make the human species less vulnerable to extinction. Omega, this is Alpha Group. Say again. The goal is not to annihilate the more powerful invader. It's to make him want to leave. What we really have to do is figure out a way to hold out and last longer. Hopefully, they'll decide it's too expensive for them to stay. They'll load up their bags and leave. Time may be running short for Earth's guerrilla armies and the entire planet. I can hear them. They're getting closer. The alien newcomers are what biologists call an invasive species. An invasive species is one that moves into an area that it's never previously occupied and disrupts the local ecology. A successful invasive species is good at moving around and disrupting the landscape, usually through aggressive behavior, which can be either actual fighting or just domination of space. Once an invasive species establishes a foothold, the damage becomes irreversible. Case in point, fire ants in the American South. These stinging Brazilian ants first came to America on a single cargo ship in 1930. Then they began to spread, conquering every other ant species in their path. These ants actually kill off every other ant that they can get their greedy little mandibles on. The invasive ants sweep over the landscape pretty thoroughly, and there's no evidence that they back off. Today, fire ants are found from Maryland to California. History does change forever once an invasive species comes in. Now, the bands of human gorillas hope to drive off the invasive aliens. 
before they transform the environment of our planet to their own needs. One way to fight an invasive species is to create more of the local species. Should I know? The war against the alien invasion will mean breeding. If we're going to create a long-term resistance, we're going to have to change our thoughts about what's acceptable in culture and society. If there's a female that's of birthing age, she needs to be pregnant with as many children as she possibly can. So there might be fertility drugs at use. A breeding program will require multiple mates. More children will require multiple pregnancies. Anyone not pregnant becomes a warrior, male or female. Any human being that's of the age of, say, 14 or older would need to be carrying a weapon. We have to create a total resistance movement by every human being that's alive. But the enemy may be hard to find. Earth's survivors have noted that, beside robots and aircraft, no aliens have ever appeared outside their craft. Perhaps they fear Earth's biology. There's a very good reason that an alien wouldn't want to get outside of its capsule once it had landed on the Earth. And this was actually realized by H.G. Wells when he wrote his novel, War of the Worlds. Uh, and that's all the bugs that are floating around in our atmosphere all the bugs and bacteria and diseases and whatnot. In the classic War of the Worlds, aliens are destroyed by bacteria. Could science fiction hold the key for Earth survivors? Could bacteria or a virus destroy our attackers? Viruses in a particular habitat evolve to engage with organic things that evolved in its habitat. Maybe we could tailor a biological weapon to attack those aliens. Their immune systems weren't developed to fight against that particular virus. Bacteria and disease are rampant among survivors deprived of antibiotics and other medicine. Now, some of the sick and dying turn their illness into a weapon, becoming biological suicide bombers. Self-sacrifice isn't just a human trait. It's a natural survival mechanism when a species is threatened. Even in the ant world, it's the sickest and oldest ants that often fight on the front lines. Living germ warfare units prepare to be harvested to spread their deadly agent among the invaders. germ warfare seems to have had no effect on the alien invaders. Biological warfare against the aliens may be a dubious tactic. In fact, astrobiologists say that humans would be more in danger from alien bacteria. The record is more biased to the invasive species that bring a parasite and wipe out the indigenous local population. Throughout history, it's happened many, many times. Famously, the conquistadors wiped out the American population of Indians to a, a huge extent through carrying smallpox. <laughs> But oddly enough, alien bacteria has not infected the human species or any earthly biology. There could be a simple reason the aliens might not be biological. Perhaps the aliens are simply machines. Travel between the stars takes either an enormous amount of energy or a very long time. And either case is kind of dangerous for biology. So it does seem to make sense that any travel between the stars that's going on in the universe is being done not by biology, but by some sort of machinery. 
It is what we did in the early stages of planetary exploration in our own solar system. We sent the robots out first to look, to report back. The theory is logical. Probes landed on the moon three years before humans did. NASA has sent probes to every planet in the solar system and beyond. If the aliens are not biological, the harvesters may not be collecting Earth's organic material for food, but for fuel, processing our planet's life forms into long-lasting biofuel. If the invaders are simply drones, that is why they never answered our pleas for peace. That's why they display indifference at the destruction of intelligent life forms. If the aliens are machines, this may offer another tactic. In the case of non-biological attackers, there is one final step in the plans to fight the alien invasion. Somehow, we've got to get some troops inside the technology to shut the technology down, and a mission like that is definitely going to be high risk. Earth's guerrilla army now plans a final all-out assault. Two teams, say again. This is Alpha. Say again. On the giant craft hovering over the planet's cities. Very often, a naval strategist will tell you if you sink the carrier, you, you win the sea battle. We might not defeat the aliens, but we might turn them back. Somehow, we've got to get some troops inside the technology to shut the technology down. And there is one simple low-tech weapon that may be a match for the best technology of hostile intergalactic invaders. A balloon. A balloon seems like an unlikely weapon, which is why it could be a game changer. It is so low-tech that it could be nearly invisible. A latex balloon is just a latex balloon. Latex is not a conductor, and it doesn't reflect radar signals, so it has a very, very low radar cross-section, as we call it. So you're not going to pick it up on the radar. Balloons have been used for weather and atmospheric research for decades, lifting instruments to the very edge of the atmosphere. But helium weather balloons are not traditional hot air balloons. They're not meant for human transportation, but they could be. This can lift as much as 20 pounds for this size balloon. Of course, then you'd have to also consider that they want a positive lift. Typically, that's about one and a half times the weight of everything that attaches to the balloon. So it would take, depending on the weight of the person, and you want some free lift, it would take at least 20 of these type of balloons to lift a person. It's been done before as a stunt, using everything from weather balloons to large children's balloons. Weather balloons just may make the perfect low-tech attack vehicle against a better equipped high-tech invader. You could do this with a bunch of big party balloons wherever you can find balloons and helium tanks or even hydrogen tanks. I can inflate this in my barn, so no one would know where these come from. They can be a real grassroots effort where they can be launched anywhere. They don't need a big, gigantic facility. Humanity's guerrilla warriors gear up to travel back to the blasted urban centers for a balloon assault. They will carry parachutes, but it's clear the chances of survival are nearly zero. A mission like that is going to be a suicide mission. Suicide missions sound gruesome, they sound horrible. Well, they are. And you have to weigh all of humanity versus a few troops volunteering to give their lives to save all of humanity.
armed with high explosives and the scavenged military bombs, the attackers lift off, steering for the underbelly of the alien machine. You can steer by moving the balloon up and down, by dropping ballast or venting helium. You can, to some extent, move the balloon up and down through the wind fields and steer it in different directions. But these men aren't alone. Around the world, a coordinated balloon assault is underway. The human race is all in, giving no chance for the enemy to adjust to this new tactic. It's a long-held military rule. With more men, the chances of success increase. Just like at D-Day, we put as many troops on the beach as we possibly can at once. Some of them are going to get through, and the more we can use, the fewer they can engage and take out. And so what we might do is have an all-out attack where we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of folks launched on these high-altitude balloons. Swarm tactics work, not only in human history, but in the insect world. Ant colonies regularly overwhelm much larger adversaries. The quality of the soldiers doesn't matter, it's their numbers. If you can outnumber the other side, the battle quickly shifts to the bigger society. A swarm going forward of army ants contacts, say, a frog that may weigh 10,000, 50,000 times as much as that ant, but instantly there are 10 ants on it, and then 20, and the frog may leap, but there's a swarm all around it. That frog is going to be carved up. But will a human swarm work with the same deadly effect as an ant swarm? The future of the planet will be determined by the tiny remnants of humanity attacking alien technology, armed only with cast-off weapons and helium balloons. In cities around the world, a massive suicide attack is underway. Low-tech vehicles could carry high-tech weapons, like backpack-sized nuclear warheads from Earth's Cold War. If you really wanted to get up there with a high-powered explosive, you'd want a nuclear device about the size of the warhead used on the Davy Crockett system. It's about a tenth the size of the one used in Hiroshima, and it was designed back in the 50s as an anti-personnel system, and it was about as big as a volleyball or so, and you get that as close to a power system or a propulsion system and detonate that, and you're more likely to have a, a real good effect. Once inside the carriers, each suicide warrior has his mission. Find the right pieces of equipment, power systems, uh, propulsion technologies, whatever they could find, and put explosives on them, and it'll destroy the whole spacecraft. Throughout history, low-tech assaults regularly succeed against superior technology. In October of 2000, an American Navy destroyer, the USS Cole, carrying a phalanx of cruise missiles, was crippled by a tiny speedboat packed with explosives. We'll learn from history. Humans have been using guerrilla warfare for thousands of years. Uh, and we understand it, it's a matter of uh, using it effectively. As the suicide warriors disappear into the alien ships, the observers on the ground know that for every low-tech assault, there are many high-tech victories. Humanity's future may ride on this one final attack. Alien tech. The same scene plays out above other cities around the world. 
humanity's swarm attack strikes home. Somewhere high above the Earth's atmosphere, an alien intelligence makes a cold calculation. This venture is now losing more than it's gaining. It's time to move on. And they lose a tenth of their population, that ought to be enough for them to say, hey, let's go over here and attack these guys that only have stones and rocks. It might be an easier fight. In the long run, the math of warfare favors the guerrillas. The Soviets ended their invasion of Afghanistan in 1989 after losing 15,000 men. It was less than 3% of the invading force, but it was enough. History reveals that an asymmetric war doesn't require massive casualties for victory. All around the world, the surviving giant craft depart for the skies. The alien invasion is over. A human victory over alien technology may have less to do with tactics and more to do with the human spirit as it's evolved over 200,000 years. We've overcome any threat that we've encountered so far. We have adapted, we have become the dominant life form on this planet, certainly. And so I, I see no reason why we would lose that capability. I would not want to be the invader that tried to attack the Earth. The alien invasion scenario is taken seriously. It has been studied. It has been planned for. Whether aliens come or not, the research itself is revealing. Even if you don't think it's likely that aliens will ever show up, it's still a useful way to look at the American defense system from the outside. And that gives you an idea to really investigate your own vulnerabilities and your own ability to respond quickly to threats. Preparing for an alien invasion is similar to preparing for earthquakes, hurricanes, military attacks, financial collapse, and pandemics. An alien attack may seem unlikely, but the others are inevitable. It's a moral imperative for humanity to figure out how to protect itself and to respond to situations like an alien invasion on a global scale. If you wait to respond to the emergency after it's happened, it's probably too late. Will alien armies appear out of the night sky? Or is the human species alone in the vastness of the universe? Both questions are disturbing. Both are intriguing thoughts to ponder while staring at the beauty of a night sky filled with billions of shining stars. <laughs>